All right, ladies and gentlemen, Jennifer Horn. Hi there. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be asked to be here and to be a speaker. Um, I believe in the AFA and I believe in the Farrier Associations, and being asked to be a speaker uh, here is, is very humbling to me. And uh, I'm glad for the opportunity. This isn't my comfort zone, so work with me. Um, I wanted to just start off a little bit. Let's see, where's the pointer thing right here? With, um, with, where do I point it at? Does it matter? Oh, over it. Okay. So I just wanted to tell you a little bit about myself because um, a lot of people don't know who I am. I grew up a horse crazy kid. That's how I got involved in horseshoeing. It was my government teacher in high school who suggested I went to farrier school. And I had a female farrier growing up as well. So when he suggested it, it was like, Oh, what a great idea. I, I knew I wanted to do something in the equine industry. And so I went to the Wolverine Farrier School in um, Howell, Mich Oops, Howell, Michigan. And top right, that's Bob Green. He's in the International Horseshoers Hall of Fame, as well as Dick Beckers in the photograph, too, also in the Hall of Fame. Two of my biggest mentors in, in uh, all through my career, Dick has been important to my career, both artistically and in the farrier world. I got involved with the Michigan Horseshoers Association, which then brought me to the American Farriers Association. And I learned how much the associations had to offer, and I have joined every association I could get involved with, whether it be a blacksmith association or a barrel horse association, it didn't matter. Each association had something that I could learn from to add to my skills. Um, competed with both Michigan and, and local events all around and I competed in some world championship blacksmith competitions and uh, sort of my goal right now is to develop my artistic blacksmithing and, and turn that into somewhat of a, a lucrative income. I was told in horseshoe school that first of all only two of us, 12 in my class, that only two of us would become farriers and I was determined to be one of those. And they also warned us that our career would be quite short and that we should have some sort of backup plan. And for a long time I thought I would become a realtor because my mother was. And uh, as I started practicing for certification and practicing for competitions, those two things went hand in hand for me. Um, I discovered the artist blacksmith stuff. And it's, it's, uh, it's nice to know that I can use the same tools and the same skill set and make a lateral move and, and not have to completely start over to be a realtor something that I had no experience or background with. And, and something about that, um, I have a book, I'm, I'm still in the process of reading, but uh, Jacob um, Butler suggested this book to me, and it's called Real Artists Don't Start. And it would apply to our barrier careers as well. And I'm not finished reading it, but I definitely recommend it. This is my house. I do live in the Eastern Upper Peninsula. A lot of people wonder why I live there. And all I can say is if you haven't been there, you don't understand. So it does have some of the assets. Our cost of living is very low. We don't have any hurricanes or spiders or tornadoes. We get a lot of that snow. It lasts a little longer than I'd like. But that also offer, offers me the opportunity to explore the blacksmith in the shop. This is my shop. It's the only horse that's ever been shot there. It doesn't fit in the shop. Uh, the guy on the stool is actually one of my barrier friends. He calls his horse to me, and I scratch my head wondering why. And he finally said, well, because you're better and cheaper. So I need to raise my prices. <laughs> the first project I ever made, and I was visiting with Austin last night. I was going to blame him for my artistic habit. And uh, I said, well, you wrote that article about the state turner. It was in today's pro farrier or professional farrier, one of the magazines. And he said, no, I've never made a state turner. It, it was my dad. And so this was the first project. I was in the shop building plain stamp shoe after plain stamp shoe after plain stamp shoe. And I was getting exhausted. And I was probably just practicing the same thing, muscle, not even thinking about what I was doing. But I was afraid if I walked out of the shop, I was going to completely forget everything I knew. I would lose my endurance. I would lose my stamina. I would just lose it. And I was afraid of that. And I had read this article. It was like in a November issue suggesting a Christmas present. 
And I thought, well, oh, this is a big long taper with a hook on the end and it had a twisted handle. Certainly I should be able to do that. So that was a way for me to stay in the shop, continue using my arm, continue being at the anvil and, and comfortable. And then after I achieved that, it was like, well, I wonder if I could make a fork then. All I'd have to do is split the bottle. And then it was, I wonder if I could make a spatula. I'd either jump weld something on or rivet something on. Then can I make a hanger and hang it on the wall? And it, the addiction started there. So we're going to blame David Eden, Eden for uh, my artistic habits. I've seen a lot of artistic demonstrations here, and I'm proud to, to now be one. Jim Keith did dragons, and he sold a whole set of uh, dragon punches on how to make faces. I brought them, in case anyone wants to take a good look at them. Um, I'm going to use a couple of them, but my idea is that my presentation would be using just the farrier tools and not so much um, artistic or other blacksmithing tools. So that they're projects that everyone can go home and do right out of the truck. One thing Jim told me, um, got it quoted here, we were talking about art and, and horse showing, and, and I truly believe that horse showing is an art. And for a long time, I didn't think I was an artist, and I didn't think I was a blacksmith. I almost took offense if somebody called me a blacksmith. But uh, Jim's quote was, um, you know, facts don't mean anything to our, us artists. And, and he thought he was going to be a scientific sure until he realized how hampered they were with facts. And, and then he decided he would be an artistic for sure. This is Charlie Hilton. I watched him also here at convention, and I was kind of blown away. Me and my friend Matt Liebeck were sitting there, and he brought out this tool and popped it in the anvil. And it's called a smithing magician. And it has a bottom die and a top die in it. And to me, it's a poor man's power hammer. So I can put a piece of material in there and work it like a power hammer. The next thing about it is that you can have different types of dies that go in there. This one would be called a butcher because it has a straight edge on one side and an angled edge on the other. And if you think about your fullers, your fullers are butchers in a sense. But you can have all kinds of different butchers, uh, dies that go in them. These are just half rounds, which would be like a drawing die or a spring die. And then I have some that are built so that I can create a tenon. On a, on a piece of rod or whatever, for whatever reason, balusters or flowers or whatever. And I just brought this to show you, I'm not gonna use the demo today, um, but it was introduced to me at an AFA convention, so I thought it was appropriate to share again. Charlie Helton, he used the Smith and Magician to, to fuller down a piece of pipe. That was square pipe that he, cut the edges at the top and turned it into a flower by pulling the stem out of it. Roy Bloom, of course, I think everybody knows who Roy Bloom is. I watched him build a turtle. This is one he just built recently. I stole it off the Facebook. And the one thing I can contribute Roy to is um, how he teaches you about moving material. And if you have never watched Cow Pies and Clips, you should watch it. It talks about the way material reacts under force and in different directions. And of course, his good buddy Tom Kobe. He, uh, I've never seen him shoe a horse, but if you look at all the rest of his work and the, and the carvings and things, I'm pretty darn sure he was pretty handy as a farrier as well. This is Bob Parks and Dick Becker, two huge influences on me. Although I never watched them here present an artistic demonstration, they certainly have, have done showing demonstrations as well. The project there is an artistic project they did together for a demonstration at a, at a blacksmith school. And there's blacksmith schools all over the country, weekend classes, week-long classes, and I strive to take a couple of classes each year myself and, and keep up on um, learning new techniques and new ideas and new projects. That's where I get my ideas. Somebody asked me this morning, where do you get your ideas? We're a mashup of all of the influences we allow into our life. And nothing is really original. If somebody says um, it's original, they probably just don't know the references that brought it to that point. 
Everything is a buildup on what came before. There's a French writer, Andrew Gitt, who said, everything that needs to be said has already been said. But since no one was listening, everything needs to be said again. So some of the things I'm going to talk about are repeats. You might have heard it already this morning in, in Chad's presentation, presented maybe from an artistic point of view instead. And uh, repetition is also a way that we remember things. So by repeating something, that's just adding to the repetition. I was once told that there was four different types of people in the world. Those that don't know, and don't know that they don't know. Those that don't know, but they think they know. Those that know, but don't know that they know. And those that know and know that they know. So I think it's pretty important that we keep that in mind and try and remember who we are in which situation. And make sure that we're choosing our mentors appropriately. Our job is to collect good ideas, and the more people you surround yourself with, and, and the better people you surround yourself with, the better ideas you're gonna you're gonna accumulate. <clears throat> so look things up, chase down references, and um, these are some of my blacksmith mentors. This this is just a small collection of my mentors and, and the mashup that makes me. But I included Derek. Derek introduced me to this particular flower that I'm going to demonstrate for you here in a few minutes. And uh, so I titled it the Bliss Flower. Um, this was his project that he introduced to me. I bought it right from him. And then I went home and I started practicing what I had saw his work. He also had a table. And I asked him, where'd you get that table from? How would you learn to build that? And he told me about a man, uh, Clay Spencer. And so I immediately sought, sought out classes that Clay was teaching and I took the class as well. That project on the left, it's, it's called an occasional table. It's about this big around, it stands about this high. It's all traditional skills, and you as farriers are all doing traditional skill work. There's no reason you couldn't uh, achieve that table. <clears throat> Clay is a, uh, retired from NASA. He worked to put things on the moon. He's absolutely brilliant. Uh, he's in Alabama taught me how to make these little treasure chests. I brought that particular treasure chest with me here, and it's full of my business cards. So if you like a business card, please take one, and if you have one, please leave one. And, and that inspired me to build the, um, the auction item that I put it in. And uh, <clears throat> that was a week-long class to build that project with instructions and, and you know, lollygagging kind of in the shop. And when I left there, three days later, I was flying to New Mexico to do the most versatile blacksmith competition, and I told him, I said, Clay, I'm going to build this in one day. And he laughed at me. He said, let me know how it goes. And uh, I gave Mark Milster a run for his money. I got second place, so I was proud of that. And his mentor was Francis Whitaker. And I love the quote that Francis has there, if you learn to use one tool well, you don't need as many tools as you think. And we can certainly relate that to our shoe businesses. Francis was, uh, his last shop was in Carbondale, Colorado. I was invited to demonstrate there this past summer. And I always thought of, when I thought of Francis Whitaker, I thought about the quatrefoil. And so I, I started practicing and studying how to build the quatrefoil. And this is just a forge building in, in a uniform radius project. And good project for you guys as well. So all of the, the tools and techniques are transferable skills from blacksmithing to our farrier work. And I remember one time I was together with my uh, three-man draft team from Michigan, and we were practicing building more shoes, and uh, they looked at mine and they're like, oh, John, you're gonna practice, right? And I was like, oh man, shoes stink. So, so yeah, yeah, I promise I'll practice. So I went home. And it was right before Christmas, our contest is in January, and I didn't practice. I was too busy making Christmas gifts and things like that. And I went back, we're practicing like every 10 days, I went back and I didn't tell them. I was embarrassed that I didn't do what I said I was gonna do. And I made my shoe and they're like, oh, right on, Jen, that's a cracker, look at that. And then I had to admit to them, I was like, you guys, I didn't practice. I've been forging, but I wasn't practicing that shoe. So 
don't be afraid to be a beginner. Just put in your practice, 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 however it is. Just like with building the clocks, just build an element. Just build, just practice that skill set and you can apply it to a roadster or a, a journeyman show or a Christmas present. You don't have to be good to start. You have to start to become good. And the one on the top is one of my first projects. Um, this one wasn't quite so bad. It had appeared, disappeared. Oh, here it is. Um, I brought one with me. And you guys are brought a whole box full of stuff. You're welcome to look at the stuff afterwards. But um, just with a flat collar and straight lines, and there's some aesthetics to that that are pleasing. But I wanted to keep evolving it, and, and that's what I'm going to show you as well. How I changed it. And then I showed it to Doug, and Doug started changing it even more. So he calls his the, the Bliss Horn Russo flower. Practice. We learn from copying. And so when we go to a horseshoe competition, what are we doing? We're practicing and copying the specimen shoes. And it's um, a good way, like that there is an Italian, the Italian Renaissance artist believed that copying the work of masters was the best way to learn, and that was the starting point for a lot of the young artists in training. So practice what's presented to you, and then take it a step further. Im imitation leads to emulation. Imitating is doing exactly what you see, and then emulating is taking that next step, looking inside the mind, or the artist of how did they do that and evolving it one step further, either into something equal or better. And emulating leads to innovation and evolving the projects. The next one is, uh, I thought I had to put it in there. Yeah, okay, that's just, this is Jim Keith's. And I added this one, he sent me some pictures and said I could pick and use what I wanted. This one's to represent that, to use your hands. Once you start using your hands, you engage your mind and your, your work will develop. Practice, practice, practice. Because this one, the slide before was, this is a bunch of the same bliss flowers, just with different size stock and different techniques applied to them at different stages of the game or, and, and they're all basically the same exact project. Wander. Wander about the world you live in. Explore things. Um, this was supposed to be a hollow dead tree like Tom Willoughby. I wanted to mimic what Tom had done. Try his anvil vulture. Didn't know what a dead tree looked like. I wandered around in the woods looking at dead trees, examining what they exactly looked like went back to the shop and, and the base was supposed to be my hollow tree, upside down, and I, I just wasn't seeing it. It just wasn't what I was feeling and I thought, I don't make dead hollow trees, I make flowers. So it turned out to be this instead. I gave that to my father. And then show your work, you know, share it with other people. Like Chad said this morning, be careful about what you're doing on, on Facebook and, and social media. But as an artist, in order to sell my art, I need to have a following. And in order to have a following, I have to have a story. And in order to have a story, I have to show my work. And so I use Facebook. People call me some sort of Facebook queen. But I use it as a marketing tool to keep my story going and keep my followers. And those are the people that I'm selling my work to. Uh, on Facebook, I'm Daisy Hill Forge is, is a public page. My own private family friend page is Jennifer DePolo Horn. It's on my business card. If you send me a friend request and I don't respond, say, hey, come on, come at you, AFA, respond to me. Otherwise, I don't just respond to anybody. Uh, if you want to see my blacksmith work, though, it's at Daisy Hill Forge page. I am not good on Instagram. I'm there, but I don't use it very much. And invite other people to come and, and wonder about projects and blacksmithing as well. This was a table end table that we did a workshop last June, and uh, I took Clay Spencer's table and I changed the design to make it my own, and then I took it to this group and presented it. We had nine farriers and one blacksmith there, 
and uh, thank goodness that there was not, that, was everyone certified, I think? And everyone went home with a table in three days. We, we kicked butt on it. Uh, Clay Levine, I won't tell the bad story about him, but what he did do is that he was at the workshop, and when he left, he went back the next, uh, back to work, and a couple days later, he sent me a message, and he said, Jennifer, my shoe shaping and fitting has escalated immensely in the past couple of days, and the only thing I can attribute it to is building these tables and really looking at the radiuses of all of the scrolls and, and finding consistency in that. And, and so it, to me it was just proof that these things really do relate back to our very work. Don't let your geography be a boundary to you. This is the Mackinac Bridge and I absolutely love the Mackinac Bridge. Uh, I've been able to go to the top of both towers, which is rare. Very few people get the opportunity to do that. But it's my gateway to the rest of the world. It's my gateway to all the knowledge and information and resources. If I just stayed in my little corner in the eastern upper peninsula, um, we're 20 years behind the rest of the world already. I can only fear what I might be if I didn't go places. And Craig probably says it best when he says isolation. Isolation is the worst disease amongst barriers. I also, every time I cross the Mackinac Bridge, I snap a picture when I stop, fuel up, whatever. I post it on Facebook, and people love seeing the photograph. But the other part of that is a marketing tool that I read in an artist marketing uh, material. Attach yourself to something large, and that's pretty, pretty big. It's five miles suspension bridge. It bridges the lower peninsula to the upper peninsula. Uh, bad weather increases good art, so I have that advantage where I live as well. That's the view of my shop. My neighbor's down there blowing my mind down to driveway. This is at the Abana 2016 contest, at, or um, conference, and FPD has now started sponsoring a Farrier's Tent there. This particular event, Shane Carter got up and built a knife. Um, Austin Edens made a pair of scissors. I had to strike for them. Jim and Kathleen Poor were there and built Tom's. Tom Willoughby was there. Bob Parks was, he was my uh, traveling buddy for that trip. And if you find that you are the most intelligent or talented person in the room that you're in, find a new room. And FPD have sponsored again. A band of conference runs every other year, so 2018, it was in Virginia, and this year, 2020, it's going to be in um, New York, and I'll be there. I was in uh, Virginia as well. It's a great, great opportunity for education, and there's more there than just artists, blacks, and stuff. The farriers are there, too. One thing I found really different between the farriers and the blacksmiths is the farriers are far more efficient, and, uh, but the blacksmiths have way more ideas, so take advantage of those. Don't use excuses for not doing something. Start with whatever's available. I go to the scrapyard all the time and just look at what could that become, what could that become. I don't do a lot of scrap art as far as you know, welding and fabricating, but I like to think, oh, what can I make out of that? Or, and, and take stuff home. So for forging, changing the shape, altering the dimension of the steel, I just want to run through like the basic, there's only a certain amount of things we do to a piece of material. We change the shape of it, we twist it, we bend it, we upset it, we split it, we weld it. And so I just want to mention maybe one or two things real quickly as we, as we go through these. Um, bending, we all bend horseshoes, right? For a blacksmith, they like to bend things where it's a lateral view and they can always see the radiuses around it. But we bend things on the horn all the time. I never thought I ever wanted an uh, anvil with turning cams on it. And now I'm like, I don't want to not have one of those because I use these things all the time, um, turning forks. This one is two pieces of angle iron that I can adjust side by side in a vise to change the space between my, my turning forks. And then they're quite often used with uh, a turning, I guess it's called a turning fork too, or turning dog. And this should be strong, full steel, or at least heavier material than whatever you're bending in it. Otherwise, they just bend too. Drawing material, like um, Austin was talking about, the, the Roadster's tapered in two directions. 
doesn't, in blacksmith, you can taper them and let the blowout occur to change lots of different aesthetics. Um, I'm a definition person. I like to know what exactly is, does that a taper mean? And I found in a Francis Whitaker book that a taper should be six to eight times in length as the stock dimension is thick. So is that a hard, fast rule? No, but it's a guideline for me. And I think if you did that and then checked against the golden ratio, it might be in the right um, parameters for that. An upset, this is Doug Russo's shoe on the right. Just trying to show that everything we do in the blacksmith thing, uh, in the farrier world, we can also do in the blacksmith world. The square corner is an upset. Do the same thing. Upset a, a section of material as you do in the toe or heel, and then bend it, forging just like a, a, a straight bar shoe, forging that corner to the outside, and I maintained a radius to the inside. That's how that done. How do you upset a great big piece of bar that's going to become a table leg? Put your anvil on the floor, or have a steel plate on the floor so that you can still forge at the proper height. Simple little tricks that you think, why didn't I think that? Cutting, we don't do a lot of cutting necessarily other than cutting steel for a barrier. You could take a big wide piece of steel and cut it right down the center and make an egg bar with no weld in it. Um, and if I, if I can get through this fast enough, I'll show you how to make the Frederick, Christopher, Christoph Frederick cross that's on the right hand side. Punching is nothing more than shearing material. And they've already talked about uh, punching a hole in, in the pritchel and the drift size. We do the same thing whether you're making a stud punch or whether you're making a, uh, I use a, a slip drift, I didn't get a photograph of one. A slip, a slot punch would be the same thing. You're gonna operate it the same way, but you're gonna make a hole that is the shape of a slot or an oval, long, narrow oval. And then with that, you run a drift through it in order to increase it to receive a pass through a round or square. You can also upset the area where you're going to make that part of punch or, or drift so that the walls of your hole don't stretch and you maintain a thicker edge around them. So these are Riley's I left home and I didn't have enough pictures, so I started messaging people, can you send me a picture of a drift? And, and my drifts, I like them to be a bit of a torpedo shape so that um, if it's a slot punch, you're gonna have a narrow hole like that so the end of your, your tool has got to be that shape as well, and then it's going to graduate until it's the radius of whatever you want the rest of the hole to be, and then it has relief immediately again, and then usually a striking end at the other end where you would hit it. Um, and, and it passes easily through the rest of the bar because it, it's narrow. Fullers is, is just to, I always thought a fuller was the exact tool. And then I couldn't figure out what's the difference between a fuller and a creaser. And I'm still not sure if I know the difference between that. But to fuller something is just to move material in a direction. And so you can have top tools, uh, bottom fullers, or handheld fullers. And of course, we use fuller all the time. That's why I use today for these quick projects. Welding, talked about that already. Those are some uh, drop tongue forge welds, they call them in the, uh, in the blacksmith world. And there's four of them. Each one of these is jump welded onto a piece of square stock. And, and then there's a weld, obviously, and a ring on the outside and a ring on the inside. Sinking and raising, I haven't figured out how to use that in the horseshoeing yet, but that was my last year's auction item and um, had a lot of fun making that. And we'll do a little bit of sinking with the flower Collaring is a traditional joinery technique, and if you need to figure out how much material you need for your collar, it's two and a half times the thickness of the material you're using for the collar added to the circumference of what you're wrapping around. Does that make sense? Um, wrapping, um, same thing as collaring, a traditional method of, of joinery, but you would just continue wrapping all the way around. And all I'm gonna say about that is it needs to be done with a torch or an isolated heat, and your heat needs to be just behind wherever you're bending. So when, if you're gonna bend around the corner, you're gonna heat behind that bend and you're actually stretching the material around whatever your circumference is. Uh, riveting is fun, super, super easy. 
and an easy way of joining lots of lots of different ways that are joining lots of different things. This was a project I made a couple of years ago, several years ago, for um, Michigan's contest. Tom Willoughby owns it, so I'm kind of proud that he has that. I did bring a box of rivets. I have a couple boxes of rivets with me. They're uh, sorted. I have a couple of them with me if somebody wants to take a box home. I haven't been able to find that. I don't know if Central Forge still sends, sells little kits, but I have a couple with me if you're interested in taking some And that ribbing is just an upsetting thing. Texturing, I don't like plasma cut projects, but if you can add some texturing to it, it really takes it to another level. And, and you can control, with texturing, you can control the way a bar moves because you're really just coloring it. You can sort of change the direction of something. Twists, started off with just a regular old rope twist. I have a whole different variety of different twists here. And then after I twisted square and awful lot, I started wondering, well, what if you twist round? Well, when you twist round, it's still round. You have to do something to the round to make it show, stand out that it, it you did a twist to it, and twisted flat, then started twisting angle to see what would happen, then twist angle and then flatten it out to see what would happen. Just experimenting and playing around. Twisting um, tube, and then I got playing around with twisting angle and round together. And this is inspired by Dorothy Stiegler. Uh, I didn't see her do it, but somebody who did shared that with me. And I try and give credit to the places where I learned things. Our, all artists appreciate that inspiration being acknowledged. And there's lots of different ways of twisting things. Our tongs are a way of twisting. We can just use our tongs. The downfall of that is you're pulling on one side, so you, you have the tendency to get this going on while you're twisting. I use a pipe wrench with um, just an additional handle welded to the other side. The advantage to that is the teeth on it, I can grab a piece around and twist it quite easily. The disadvantage is the teeth leave marks. So uh, these are other options for twisting wrenches. And then just combine. Combine the different things that you're twisting or fullering or texturing. Um, just combine things and see what you can come up with. You'll be delighted. Then evaluate your work. This is a scorecard I got from Les Armstrong when I was on cultural exchange. And it's from the Worshipful Company of Blacksmiths, uh, their competition score card. You have to understand what you're being scored on if you're going to address those categories. And I have copies of those with me if somebody wants. And there's comments, remarks about each type of category and, and what the judge is looking for. So how do you develop the artistic eye? We can use tools. And I just have a few to mention. This is called a center finder. It's two pins and it has a hardened point in the center. I can lock it onto a piece of bar, twist it till it locks, and then score lined on the center of something. I think it's pretty cool. But your crescent wrench or your calipers would do the same thing. The hoof square, I don't know if you've seen them before, but I, I think it's handy. I use them in a lot of different places. Dividers. It's a ruler with no numbers on it, and for a long time I couldn't read a ruler. I finally learned how, but to me that's a ruler with no numbers. This is called a gap gauge that very, or blacksmiths will use a lot, and you can check the dimensions of either round or square. It's got a ruler on it, and it's marked $15. comes from a guy in Ames, Iowa. Did you find him? Not yet, but um, it's worth it. I, I think it's handy. I couldn't tell the difference between 5 sixteenths and 3 eighths for a long, long time. And then, of course, this is Roy Bloom's little gap gauge for how we set up our, our lunches and rituals. So I do believe that balance, that there's a balance between the art and science and and, and I'm putting a little bit uh, more attention to the art. I never thought of myself as an artist, but art can be an art. And if you're not an artist, don't think you're an artist, give yourself a little bit more credit and explore it. So this is uh, the bliss flower that we're going to start the fire real quick that I'm going to show you. Uh, this is my little brother from another mother, probably not Doug Russo, who's going to be my assistant. And this is a, a folded dog, I call it. Uh, Gordon Williams, who is also a farrier. I don't know if he still shoots horses, but he demonstrated in the farrier's tent at the first Havana conference. 
Um, I took, spoke about 2016, and he showed how to build this little dog, so I thought I'd share it with you guys. They're fun. And then a leaf, a leaf to blacksmiths is a lot like a horseshoe to barriers. Everybody builds one, and we still sit around and watch each other build one. So I was going to show you just my style of building a, a, a leaf. I've been trying to study um, other leaf varieties and ways of changing it. And then this is the Christoph Frederick Cross, built out of a railroad spike. Uh, he was a Swiss blacksmith with a water-powered blacksmith shop, which I think is very cool. Um, and even though some of our mentors may not be available, you know, I didn't get to spend any time around Edward Martin or even meet Jay Sharp, but their work is left behind, even though they're no longer with us. Uh, Riley and Patrick gave me a uh, video of both of their videos on, uh, and I was surprised Edward Martin's had a ton of artistic forging and blacksmith work in it, and I just watch them over and over and over again. And uh, Samuel Yellen was my mentor, Clay Spencer's mentor, and he's no longer with us. In, in the height of Samuel Yellen's work, he was 1915, he had 268 blacksmiths working in a shop in Philadelphia. And if you look closely, this is a detail of a, of a bigger gate. That flower that Derek Bliss introduced to me to is in that gate. And, and this gate's from, I think, 1909. So pretty cool that so I'm going to show you how to do these things. Um, it's a picture of me and my father. Jim Keith did it, and uh, um, Vince Smith gave it to me when my father was first uh, diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. My father is a technology guy. He's always up to date on the newest, the newest, the newest, and always using the newest tools and techniques available. And I'm in the shop struggling to try and do something, and he's like, Jennifer, why don't you just plug weld it? I was trying to do a little tiny mortise and tenon, and I was like, I gotta do it traditional. And he said, Jennifer, even the blacksmith would use the most up-to-date technology available to them. So if you think about it, the blacksmith developed the welder, he developed the power hammer, he developed all these other things. So I try to remember that when I insisted on, on doing traditional things. And it, it plays a big influence on, if you're doing commission work, how much going to make because you're doing piecework like barrier work, not, uh, not by the hour necessarily. I built a storyboard for um, the Bliss Flower. It's in this little box right here. I also built a storyboard for the Frederick Cross that's up here. And I built a storyboard for the dog as well. And it's here as well, so you can see the step-by-step -step process. Did you give me a square in there? Oh, here it is. Okay. So it doesn't matter what size material you're starting with. I don't have any idea what time it is. Oh my god. Alright, we're not gonna get through all of them. We'll go as fast as we can, yeah. So I'm not gonna talk. Doug, maybe you should talk while I'm Forging. Uh, first thing I'm going to do is bring it out. I'm going to use my anvil devil to fuller in a notch on all four sides. That's step one. Then I'm going to smash cow pie with a basketball all of my petals out into some sort of petal shape. Then I'm going to fuller them a vein down the center. I'm just going to use a little curved fuller. And then I'm going to drop it into a miniature switch block, which if you don't have a miniature switch block or a big switch block, anything will work. These are race bearings. You could have a piece of round stop. You could even use your party hole. Uh, you just need a place that you can sink material into. If you do not have one of these ample devils, go to Stockoff's booth at the trade show and buy one. They're like five or six dollars or something ridiculously cheap and I, I use it all the time. So I'm not going to talk, I'm just going to do this really quick. I can probably do it in three weeks if I just go at it. I 
we're just fine in the center. Is what you're trying to achieve. 
So I'll stick it down there and create a little bit of a bowl. And then no different than turning a, a rocker toe or turning a trailer or, or extended heels, I'm gonna let my left hand do the bending. S curves are sexy, even in blacksmith work, so I'm creating that S curve. You could go ahead, I didn't do it in this one, but um, I also like to go ahead and run around, practice boxing or see if you can run a bevel edge all the way around all four sides. And if you need to add a little color to something, when it's at a black or heat, get yourself a, a little copper or a brass brush and you can rub some brass onto it. It'll happen with a little cooler heat than uh, hotter. Sometimes just a highlighted area before you can do the whole entire thing. I normally wear a belt buckle that's one of these flowers and then layered up the one behind it has eight petals, maybe without the vein in it. I have that over there too that you can look at as well. So that's the bliss flower in here. And then uh, we're going to do the folded dog, the Gordon Williams folded dog real quick. This one to me is uh, an opportunity to practice heels. I, I'm not real good at heels. Do you have the three eight tongues? And so this is a, a good practice. So I'm just going to, like Austin was doing, my hammer closed. My, my stick is almost stuck in my armpit and knock down the corners, not upset them. Get just a little bit more heat on them while I catch my breath for a second. 
That's what I want is a sharp corner on this anvil. And it looks like this one on the step is the best place for it. So I'll give it a try. And I'm gonna hold the head at a 45 degree to the corner. And the first blow is gonna be trying to bite that corner, that sharp corner into the forehead of the dog. And then as I get it bit, I'll lift my tongue here just a little bit and sort of like pulling a clip, sort of drag that ear out. Be my own 
one power hammer until I neck it down enough. And then I can use my fuller again. give them a little bit of a collar, and I can either use my center punch or stud punch or even a four, four punch or whatever to give them a little
two variations of the bliss flower. I was trying to make dogwoods. And I started with this one, and then when I started looking at the lines of it, something didn't look right. And I went back to the computer and started studying pictures of dogwoods and, and noticed that the lines went in and not out. So I changed it the other direction. Same exact project as the flower I just showed you. So the next step is to pull her back behind the point I just made. And I want to stay relatively close to that shoulder. How far her back will change the length of the flower for sure. Oops. Go ahead.
more than told my hammer and pull it to me. Or I gotta get around this way.